Delta's AFC information, Papa. Time 1455. Winds calm. Visibility greater than 10 miles. Broken 16,000 feet. Temperature 24. Dew point 08. Altimeter 30 decimal 09. Runway to new 03 right to 1 left. Expect visual approach. Acknowledge receipt of information, Papa, and advise aircraft. Decimal zero nine. Runway to new zero three right to one left. Task two, check in. Two's up. Raj, let me know once you're ready to taxi. Dallas clearance, Tusk 2, clearance on request, ready to copy. Tusk 2, clearance. Cleared to Dogbone via fighter departure as filed. Expect range entry through 63 Bravo. Climb and maintain Angels 12. Departure on 385.4, squawk 4017. Tusk cleared to Dogbone via fighter departure. Range entry expected at 63 Bravo. Climb and maintain Angels 1 2. Departure on 385.4. Squawk 4017. Thanks. Tusk 2, read back correct. Contact ground on 275 decimal 8. See ya.
Pull up, pull up. Altitude, altitude. She's got a good jet and I'm ready to taxi. Zero nine. One's good and ready for taxi. All right. Before we pull trucks and head north, let's recap the game plan. Sounds good. The plan is to head up to the Dogbone Lake area and do some work with the targeting pod. This will be the meat and potatoes portion of today's sortie. We'll be going over a lot of things, so just pay attention and keep up. 
We'll also talk about last day, which Biff should have visited on a later sortie. He also wanted me to do a quick recap on fencing in and out. We're going to dive into the pod pretty deep since it is a complex piece of the puzzle and you're new to it. I'm excited to finally get into it. The Lightning is a phenomenal addition to the A-10's toolbox. It brings a ton of capability to the jet, which we'll get into. But for now, we need to take a look at the Lasty system, and more specifically, the wind edit function. Let's do it. The low altitude and targeting enhancement, or Lasty for short, was introduced in the A-10A back in the 90s. Over the years, it has been updated and things added to it. Our autopilot, ground collision avoidance system, GPS, better targeting for ammunitions, and so on and so forth. Yep, a lot of that is carryover from the A-10As that I flew. Yeah, I think the Sweet 2 A-10As had a lot of what you see in the Charlie, even the AG and the FC. Sounds right. So wind edit allows us to input atmospheric data like wind speed, wind direction, and outside air temperature are up to seven different altitudes or layers. Handy. So this is going to help dial in our accuracy, yeah? Exactly. The IFC will take the data we input into the wind edit page and adjust the paper accordingly. You may not notice a huge difference when you're strafing, but you will see it when you're dropping CBU 97 from 10,000 feet. Regardless, it is always a good idea to input wind data so you have the most accurate firing solution possible. Sold. Go through the process together by plugging in current wind data for the local area, and we'll do that for seven layers for today. Cool. I'm ready when you are. Bring up the CDU page on one of the MFCDs. Once you're in that, press Function and then 1 on the UFC. This will take you to the system page. Let me know if you're still with me. Okay, I'm in the system page. You should see Lasty next to OSB7. Press OSB7 to enter the last day's subpage. Once you've done that, you should see wind at the bottom right. Press OSB10 to go into the wind page branch. Okay, it looks like I'm in the wind page. Near the top right corner, you should see three asterisk, four slash, three more asterisk, and plus 24. That is the current wind speed from direction and speed, followed by the temperature and degrees Celsius. Since we are sitting on the ramp and not moving, we only have data for the temperature. No wind speed or direction is provided. When we get in the air, we'll get the wind data for the current altitude and position. Roger. This is a handy feature so that if need be, you can gather your own wind data to plug into the last day. On your climb out, you can write down the altitudes, wind speed, direction, and temperature, then plug all that information in to build an accurate wind profile for the jet to use. This uses winds entered in MSL, correct? Not AGL? Altitude MSL, yes, exactly. Cool. Just wanted to make sure. Nothing wrong with that. So here in Nellis, the low glare is pretty high, so we'll start building our wind profile at 2,000 feet. We'll add in layers for 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 10,000, 12,000, 17,000, and 25,000 feet for today. The winds are entered as thousands of feet using two digits. So 2,000 feet would be 02, and 15,000 feet will be 15. We're not going to be employing munitions today, so we can just input some generic data. Since we do have data for the 2000 block, let's use that. For the rest, reference your kneeboard and input that information into it. Got it? So far. Good. First, we have to put in all of our wind levels, 
Then we have to go into the wind data page and add in the wind data. Let's go ahead and input those altitudes. To do that, type 02 on the UFC, then hit OSB 18 to put 02 in the top entry. You should see that 02 fill in right under ALT. Yes? Firm. Next, type in 04 and press OSB 17, then 06 and OSB 16, which should fill up all of our spots for entry, yeah? Yeah, looks that way. No problem. Press function and the data rocker up on the UFC to go to page two of the... There we go. Go ahead and type in the other four altitudes, the same as you did for the others, and let me know when you're done. Raj, stand by. All right, I've got layers for one zero, one two, one seven, and two five thousand. Good. The next thing we're going to do is add in the wind speed and direction. Sounds good. The first thing we're going to do is go from the wind page into the wind edit page. So next to OSB 8, it says wind edit. Press that OSB to enter the page. now says wind edit at the top of the page. That is what we're wanting to see. So now let's plug in those wind directions, wind speeds, and temps. First up is our 2,000 feet layer. It is 350407. Without any spaces, type in 35007 on the UFC and press OSB 18 to input that data for the layer. Next will be the temperature, and it is 24 degrees at 2,000 feet. To input that, type in 24 into the USC and press OSB 8 to put it into that field. I have plus 24 on the right now. As I'm sure you can guess, that is indicating a positive 24 degrees Celsius. If we need to input a negative temperature, simply press the applicable OSB again, and you'll see the plus sign change into a minus sign. Press OSB 8 again to watch that happen, and when you've done that, finish inputting the rest of the supplied wind data, and let me know when you're ready to move on. Raj, stand by. Talking about all this made me think to add, if you ever need to check the magnetic deviation, it's really easy. On the USA, just press function, then hack. That will take you to the position info page. On it, you'll see right under your airspeed and mark MV, followed by either E for east deviation or W for west and the deviation in degrees. Sorry, uh, keep punching in the winds and I'll leave you alone. You're fine, you're fine. Thank you for that. No problem.
data for all seven layers. Nice. I guess we're ready to taxi then. Call ground and I'll follow you out. Wait, did you hit up clearance delivery already? Okay, just making sure. Nellis Ground, Tusk 2 is 2 A-10s at Thunder with Papa and ready for taxi to 0 3 right. Tusk 2, Nellis Ground, taxi golf to Alpha, ho short 0 3 right. Papa is current. Taxi Golf Alpha hold short zero three right for Tusk Two. All right, let's roll. I miss the Viper sometimes. You used to fly them? Yep. Back when I was active duty. Roger. As a matter of fact, uh, Biff and I were at Mountain Hope together for a period of time. I was in the 389th flying Block 52s, and uh, Biff was in the 391st flying the F-15 Echo.
Task 2, switch to tower 327.7. Task 2, switching to tower. Two switched. Coming up to the hold line. Two. Nellis Tower, Tusk 2, holding 03 right at Alpha. Tusk 2, winds are calm, clear for takeoff 03 right. Tusk 2, clear for takeoff 03 right.
still is rolling. is wheels up. Ellis departure, Tusk 2. Tusk 2, over departure. Tusk 2 is just out of Nellis and to the northwest. Tusk 2, radar contact. Continue direct for Fighter 4, maintain Angel 14. Direct for Fighter, climb and maintain Angel 14. Since we probably have got a few minutes, let's talk about the AN slash AAQ 28 Lightning AT targeting pod. Sounds good. The Lightning pod is a widely used advanced targeting pod built by Northrop Grumman and Israel's Raphael Advanced Defense System. It is a little over 7 feet long and weighs 455 pounds. It was used on the A-10A late in its life, but in a peculiar manner. What do you mean by that? This was all before my time, but as I understand it, back in 2002, the A-10A was being readied for its involvement in what would become Operation Iraqi Freedom. The Alpha was never really wired for a TGP, but the A-10A weapons officers knew it needed a targeting pod, so they had to do some clever shit to get it to work. They made the jet think that it was talking to a Maverick, and they made the pod think that it was talking to a Block 30 F-16. As somebody said, it was a technology demonstrator that wound up going to war. Huh, that's hilarious. Get it done, I guess. You're damn right. I'm back on track now. Having the TGP has become a huge asset to the horror community for so many reasons. It allows us to self-designate our own laser-guided bombs or others, generate targeting data for JDAMs, get in a close-in, higher resolution look at our potential target, generate a speed, shoot an IR beam, and so many other things. It is one of the biggest tools in our box. I'm sure of that. The pod aids us in positive target identification, surveillance. It helps to keep us out of AWES while watching or searching for something. Coupled with the data link, it can help us ID friendly positions and so much more. Just like anything else though, it does have its disadvantages. First and foremost, the narrow field of view. It is easy to take what you're seeing in the pod and not get the full picture of the situation. The narrow FOV also makes finding things tough sometimes, especially when you're close to where you're looking. 
also, it is easy to get sucked into the pod and lose his knee. It's important to keep one eye on the pod and another eye on what's going outside the jet, so to speak. Yeah, for sure. How about we go ahead and turn the pod on, so that when we get to the range, it's already on and ready to go. Sounds good. On the AHCP, we'll find the TGP switch. Go ahead and put it into the on position. This will power up the pod and start cooling off the flare. This process takes about a minute before the pod is fully up and ready to use. As a matter of fact, go ahead and put the TGP page up on one of the MSCDs. Okay, TG page is up and the TGP switch is in the on position. Good. So right now you should see not timed out being displayed over a black background. As it comes online, that background will change to gray. When that happens, you'll see some OSB options appear, and then some text telling you about version numbers and stuff will also appear. After that, the stuff in the center of the screen will disappear, and it will go back to a black background, and a green box around standby will appear near OSB3. This indicates that the pod is on and ready to be used, but in standby mode. Copy all. We'll pause the lesson now and pick it back up once we get to dark bone. Roger.
Okay, picking the lesson back up. The first thing about using the pod is that in order to use it effectively, we need to do what we can so that it doesn't get masked by the jet. Probably the most obvious way to do this is by keeping the area we're looking at in front of us or off to the side that the pod is on. We usually fly it on station 10 over the right wing, so we'll do clockwise or right-hand orbits today. Raj. With that in mind, go ahead. Bring steer 3 down the right side and set up a nice wide right-hand orbit around Dogma. Just make sure we don't wander into the container up there to our northwest. Give me a heads up when you're ready. Right-hand orbit around the lake pad. Bring up the TGP page on one of the MSCDs. The pod should be well and truly ready by this point, so when you bring it up, you should see that the top STB wire standby option is highlighted. Yep, that's what I'm seeing. So that indicates that the pod is in standby mode. We can activate the pod by pressing either the air-to-air -air or air-to-ground options. Doing so will unstow the sensor and bore sight the pod. Keeping it in standby mode rolls the ball back into the stowed position and protects the lenses from bugs, birds, and being sandblasted. Press OSB2, A to G, to put the pod into the air-to-ground mode. Alright, the pod is now in air-to-ground mode, and I've got video. We're going to spend quite a lot of time today on the pod, so we're not going to cover its air-to-air -air application. This we'll have to pick that up on a later sortie. For today, just know that the air-to-air -air mode exists. 
Roger. Looking at the Eric Rampage, you can see that we've got a lot going on here. Let's have a look at all of that information in more detail. Let's. Across the top OSB is not much has changed from the default standby page. The only difference here is that the ADT option is now all highlighted, indicating that we're now in air to ground mode. What about where it says wide on the left? We're not quite there yet, but don't worry, we'll get there. Sorry. No problem. On the right, you see a new option for LSS next to OSB 6. On the AHCP, flip the laser arm switch into the armed position, and you'll see LSR pop up the OSB 7. Give me a heads up when you've done that. Laser is armed, and I see LSR next to OSB. LSR indicated that when the nose wheel steering button on the stick is suppressed or the auto fire function reaches its set time to impact, only the laser will fire. Pressing OSB 7 again will set it to IR, which will only fire the IR pointer. Pressing it one more time will fire both the laser and the IR pointer. This mode is indicated by this or both being displayed next to OSB 7. Down at OSB 11, we have DCLT R declutter. Pressing it will remove the OSB labels at the top and along both the left and right hand sides. Right now, I don't have anything on the left since I'm in CCD mode in the pod. Fly the TGP page for me by pressing either the Cooley hat towards the MFCD page with the pod on it, or simply by pressing the OSB where it says TGP. If you've done it correctly, you'll see TGP highlighted green and the green box outlining the TGP page. Also, make sure your boat switch is in the center so that when you soy the pod, you don't go into an IR mode yet. your TGP to steer 4. This way we can both be looking at the same thing and ensure the pod is looking at something and not just bore sighted ahead of us. To do this, make sure you have steer 4 selected and then simply hold China hat F long and it should drive the sensor to it. Give me a heads up once you're good. And visual on the airfield on the link. Good. Slew the pod and have a look around the field. As you do this, have a glance over at the tad. There you'll see a green diamond. The diamond indicates where the pod is looking. Once you're ready to move on, hold the China hat F long to drive the pod back onto steer 4 and let me know.
You can adjust this value by typing in the desired depression into the UFC and then hitting OSP5 to input that number. Go ahead and foresight the pod for me. After you've done so, you'll need to slate TGP back to the mark point or the steer point. re the pod, then slate it back to the steer point for me, and then we'll move on to the next.
let's dive into the options we have to adjust the functionality of the pod and the information that's displayed. Hit her better. Let's get at her. Um, okay. We'll first look at the air to ground control page. Press OSB1 to enter this page. Let me know when you're looking at it. Starting with OSB6, we've got our focus reset. This will automatically adjust the focal length on the CCD sensor. Next, we have the coordinate display section. We can choose whether the pod gives us coordinates in lat long, MGRS, or we can even turn it off. Under that, we have latch on or off function. Latch off will only fire the laser, IR pointer, or both. Only as long as we have the nose wheel steering button held down. Latch on fires it until it's shut off. So with latch on, we press and release nose wheel steering. This will fire the laser. The pod will continuously fire until we press nose wheel steering again to shut it back off. With me so far? Yes, ma'am. OSB9 is where we'll find our yardstick option. It can either be set to metric, which is displaying meters, or we switch it over to the imperial system, labeled as US, which will display in feet. OSB10 is for the gain control, which we're not going to mess with, and we're not messing with the clear interrogation on OSB16 if you're in CCD mode. Get you playing with the pod in a little bit. It's fine. I know. We need to cover all of this and that, and it is all important. It is. Okay, OBS or OSB 17 has her laser spot search code. The value that we put in here will be the pulse repetition frequency that the lightning pod will look for when we activate the LSS function. It will be important to input the correct code, otherwise if you've got the default code of 1688 in there, but the laser source you're looking for is shooting for a PRF of 1121, your pod will never find it. Right up above it we've got L at OSB 18. This is the PRF that our pod will shoot. Here it will be important to make sure the PRF your pod is shooting matches what the MAU 169s on the front of your G12s are looking for, or your wingman's bombs if you're buddy lazy. We adjust both through the UFC, and we'll do that here in a few minutes. Good to go. 
calendar, so actually let's go ahead and get the pod configured for what we're going to be doing today. So you've got the attitude advisory set up. Let's set up the PRF. I'm going to have you go with 1222, two, two, and I'll go with 1221. On the USC, type in 1222, two, two, and then press OSB 18 to input that for L. One, two, 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 set. Now input my PRF of 1221 two, one for the spot search. Continuing our way around the control page, switch out units to USA, latch to ON, and set cords to MGRS on OSBs 9, 8, and 7, respectively. to return to the air to ground page. Done. All right, let's go over some of the symbology we see displayed on the targeting pod page. Starting from the top left, we have our field of view indication, which will say either wide or narrow, depending on what you're in. And just above that, we have OZ. This is our zoom factor. Zero is zoomed all the way out, while a factor of 9 is zoomed all the way in. Got it. Back on the top right, again we have our sensor type, and below that should show a zero. That is our radar altitude. Down at the bottom center is the coordinates where the pod is looking. Just to be sure we're looking at the same stuff and you did not accidentally slew the pod or set a different speed, ensure you've got Steer 4 airfield selected. Pressing TMS down long to set Steer 4 as speed and then China Hat half long to slave the TGP to the steer point. elevation that is shown is the DTSAS. The DTSAS is phenomenal but not always 100%. And if you ever need to double check the accuracy of the DTSAS elevation, screw the pod to where it is you need to check and laser it real quick. The laser will update you with the no shit elevation for that point. Noted. I'll leave it to Biff to dive into that more when the time comes. And the Bottom left hand corner we have a very basic altitude indicator and an alt meter with the bigger numbers for thousands of feet and the smaller one is hundreds. So in that display a big 18 and a small 3 would be 18,300 feet ASL. 
He's going to just help aid your SA when your head's down. Word. Above the attitude indicator, we have a digital clock that displays the current Zulu time. That should be the last bit of symbology along the perimeter of the targeting pod page. Next, we'll look at all the things that are inside that perimeter. Right on. Starting in the top right corner, find the north arrow. The line with an arrow at the end of it is the north pointer. There are lines extending east, south, and west also. The north arrow will always point northward. Note that it is normalized to the ground, so when whatever we're looking at, the pod, is at a shallow angle, the pointer will appear flatter, and maybe a little harder to read and discern direction. The north arrow really helps when we're doing talk on through the pod when it is used correctly. Roger. Hit China hat forward long for me to center back up onto steer four, then using the north arrow in the pod is the F-86 east route west from the hangar. value is either in feet or meters, depending on what you have it set to in the options. The yardstick itself is the ground distance covered by one of the right horizontal lines in the crosshair. Understood. Let's try a little exercise with the yardstick real quick. At so far, there are a handful of airplanes on the ramp. Tell me the distance between the southernmost plane and F-86 and the northernmost plane, which is an S3. Would that distance be closest to one mile, a quarter mile, one click, or 100 meters? Bottom right and towards the center, we have the range and source information. The range is the slant range to the target in nautical miles, and the letter to the left is one of the three letters used to identify the source of that range. E means that the pod is not tracking a target, and no laser ranging is available. T indicates that a target is being tracked, we still have no laser ranging. And finally, L indicates that we have laser ranging available to us. Moving on, let's talk about our laser status. Info will find a laser status. This can be a combination of the following letters L for laser, B for pointer only, B for both laser and pointer, and T for training. Hey, 
forgot to mention it, but there will be an M between your range and your source when the targeting pod is masked by the airframe or stores. Mike for mask. Got it. Kind of in the bottom middle of the page, you can see the track mode. Basically, we have an area and point mode. Area is stabilized over an area, but not over a specific object. If we're looking through the pod in area mode and we mask the pod, it will default into INR-A, or inertial area mode. This will keep on the spot that you were last looking at until the pod becomes unmasked, at which time it will revert back into the area mode, and you should still be looking at the same thing, providing that it hasn't moved. Point mode will stabilize on and track a specific target, even if it's moving or starts moving. When in point mode, you should also see a box over the track in the TGP. If the pod goes masked while you're looking at a target in point mode, it will go into the INR-P mode. This is the inertial point mode. If the target is moving when the pod goes masked, the pod will continue to follow the last seen direction and speed. If the target continues in the same direction and speed, when you come unmasked, it should be right there. However, if it stops, turns, or stops moving in another direction, you may have to search around to find it. Roger. In the bottom left, we've got a 1, which indicates our INS performance rating. In the top left, we see M1. This is the select mask shape for the A10C. So long as you're flying the hog, you should always see M1. M1 always for the A10. Got it. In the center of the TTP air to ground page is the crosshair. There are a few variations of the crosshair. If you're ready, we can have a look at those. In its simplest form, we have the straight line crosshair with an opening in the center. This represents an area track reticle. If we put the pod into point track and pick up a track, that opening at the center will become boxed. If you're in a wide field of view, you'll see the indicators out towards the corners of the crosshairs. If you have the IP pointer set to be fired by itself or with the laser, you'll see small perpendicular lines at the outer edges of the crosshairs. The last bit of TGP page symbology we're going to talk about is the situational awareness cube. The SAQ is a small white box that you see floating around at the TGP display. The SAQ shows you your TGP's line of sight, or where it is looking in azimuth and elevation. So if the dot was in the center of your display, the TGP would be looking directly underneath your aircraft. If the dot was halfway between the center and the edge of the display at the 3 o'clock position, the pod would be looking at a 45 degree downward angle off your right wing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I've got it. Cool. I will say this as a final parting shot on the SAQ. Pay attention to it. As implied by its name, it helps build your SA. It can be a good tool to help you visually find something out of the canopy and so much more. Just don't forget that it is there, more or less. Sounds good. Use the pod to look about a mile to the southeast of the airfield, and you should see a large facility with four smokestacks. Papa Alpha 394706. Let me know when you see the building in the pod.
contact. Roger. With the pod centered on the building with the smokestacks, and with TGP soy, makes the TGP generate the speed by pressing TMS forward long. As you do this, you should see a white three-tiered wedding cake appear over the top of the green diamond in the tad. Also, in the lower left of the HUD, you'll see the speed generator indication switch from STPD to TGP. Wherever your TGP looks now, that's going to be your speed. dragged off what you're looking at accidentally, or you'll scan a quarter mile down the road in the wrong direction, and you'll need to get back to that point of reference quickly. Having a mark point on it will allow you to drive the pod right back to that spot. With that in mind, foresight the pod. As this happens, you should see the pod snap to its foresight looking straight ahead are, more correctly, 150 mils below the zero sight line directly ahead of the aircraft. In the TGP page, you'll see the SAQ at the 12 o'clock position, and slightly depressed. In the HUD, the TGP diamond will appear in the middle. Give me a heads up when you're boresighted. Alright, I'm boresighted. Pretty easy, right? So, to the saddle, can broadcast our speed just like what you learned when you talked about the TAT. Just make sure you've got the correct speed generator set. You don't want to broadcast your steer point instead of what you're tracking in the TGP, right? Since you've already covered it, we're not going to dive into it more than that. Roger. Before we move on, reset the speed to the steer point for me as TMS asks long. You should see STPT reappear back in the HUD. Let me know once you've cleared the speed, and we'll move on to mark point. Speed is cleared off. Sweet. Generating a mark point in the pod is remarkably easy. Again. I highly recommend dropping mark points like breadcrumbs. Should you become lost in your search through the pod, they can help you find your way back. In order to drop a mark point on whatever the crosshairs are pointing at, all we need to do are two simple steps. First, make sure the TGP is soy and looking where you want the mark point. Next, hit TMS right short and that is it. The mark point will be placed right in the middle of the crosshairs. Mark points are generated sequentially, so if the last one you used was golf, for instance, the one you just generated will be hotel. The way I ensure that I've successfully generated a mark point is that I look on the tab real quick. I should see a green box with the corresponding mark point letter with it over the TGP diamond. Let me know when you've created a fresh mark point. Do the pot anywhere you please and generate a mark point as we just discussed. I just outlined. 
Let me know when you're ready to move on, and we will. That worked like a charm. Great. Place the steer point dial back into the flight plan for me. about it later on in the syllabus, but you can do some really neat shit with the clever use of mark points. Like dropping a stick of four JDAPs or WCMDs in one pass onto different targets. Hot damn! That sounds pretty epic. It is, especially when it's in compact. We're going to look at generating a speed off the HUD and driving the TGP to it next. Raj, uh, what about using the helmet? I think Biff is going to go all over the helmet stuff on one sortie later down the road, so we're not going to mess with it today. Anyways, I've got a story about setting a speed off the TDC in the HUD. Let's hear it. The caveat is this was during an air warrior exercise and not combat. Anyhow, we are upstation and we're looking for some asshole e treaty in a white Toyota Hilux pickup truck with some Dale Earnhardt number threes on the door some goon put out there for PID. Well, we're up there looking in this wide valley for this dude. We can't find him. Then, all of a sudden, I catch this faint glint way the hell out there miles away. I padlock it. As I roll in to put the nose on it and bring the spot I'm looking at into the HUD's FOV, drive the TDC over the area, set a speed, slave the pod to it, and start looking for something shiny in the TDP page. Please tell me you saw the Intimidator's number on the door. You know it. They had it configured as one of those remote control targets. I closed in and obliterated it with a two second burst. We must have looked for that truck for like an hour. That two second burst made it press it though. Haha, <laughs> that is awesome. Praise hell, praise Dale. I guess. Well, I'll teach you to do it. Should you ever have to go find the number three or any other race trucks. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll go through the process, then I'll have you execute it afterwards. Does that work? Sounds good. Let's do it. Uh, so to speak. To state the obvious, what we're wanting to look at needs to be within the HUD's field of view. Next, make sure the HUD is our soy by pressing coolie hat up, verifying that by the asterisk in the lower left. You're going to want to see the target designator cue box inside of the total velocity vector. If you don't see that TDC box inside of the TVV, China hat after short will recage the TDC to the TVV. Next, using the slew control, move the TDC to where you want it. After you slew it out to a spot on the ground, it should be ground stabilized. Providing all that has worked, make your TDC generate the speed by TMS forward long, then a little China hat forward long action to get all your things looking at the speed. Okay, so to recap, soy the HUD, make sure the TDC is inside of the TVV, put the point of interest inside of the HUD's field of view, next, slew the TDC over the spot, DMS up short if needed, and if it automatically ground stabilizes, DMS forward long, then shine a hand forward long. That sound about right? That sounds correct. Go ahead and find something with your eyes. Point the jet at it and do the rest of the process like we talked about. 
practice it a few times if you like. When you've had your fun, we'll move on. Sounds good. I'll let you know when I'm done. All right, I think I get the idea. What's next? Tracking moving targets in the TGP is what's up next. Sleep the pod to steer five for me. Somewhere in that area, we should have an APC driving around in circles for us.
I've got steer five in the pod. Looks like a shipping container is there or something. Yep, that's what we want to see. You may have to go into a wide field of view and zoom out, then look around to find a truck when we're ready for that. For now, let's have a word about moving targets in the charging pod. Sounds good. A few things about getting and maintaining a point track on a moving target. Firstly, your TGP may not get a solid track on your first attempt. You may have to adjust your zoom level on the video in the TGP page. It's going to be easier for the pod to track something that contrasts well with the surrounding environment. It will usually be easier to drag the crosshairs out in front of the fixed path and let it drive into them versus letting the pod try and pick it up with them right on top of it. Why is that? It seems to pick up the track a little more efficiently. At least it does for me. Roger. Have a look in the area around Steer 5 and locate that APC. Do you want me to reposition and set up an orbit over Steer 5? Negative. I actually want you to go masked at some point so I can show you something. If your 5 is currently masked for you, that's fine. Just continue to spin until you go unmasked. Let me know when you're visual on the moving APC. TMS forward short will cycle you between area and point track mode. Please ensure that you're in point track. Point track mode set. Now I want you to achieve a stable point track on that APC. Your indicators for this will be a so-called point track box appeared centered over the object being tracked and the pod will move with the track, keeping it all centered in the display. Roger. Stand by, one. Looks like I've got a good track here. Good job. Even with the pod tracking a target, we can adjust our field of view and zoom levels switch between IR and EO and set a speed on that track as we would a static target. Nice. So the next thing we're going to look at is actually using the laser and IR pointer. Obviously, the targeting pod has a laser in it for targeting. It also has an IR pointer. Unfortunately, we can't do much with the pointer right now since it's daytime. That's unfortunate. You will get to play with it when you do your night sortie. Anyways, the pod will emit a beam of IR light that anyone wearing night vision will be able to see, but anyone not wearing night vision will never see it. That's pretty rad. It is neat the first time you see it. It literally looks like a laser beam straight from the jet down to the road where the pod is looking. The laser emits light in a spectrum that cannot be seen by either NODs or the naked eye. We can adjust its pulse repetition frequency, PRF, or as some folks call it, the laser code. The pod will always default to 1688 on power. 
but through the menu we can change that PRF to match our laser guided weapons or another attacker's weapons. Yeah, I think you've already talked on some of that. Shit, uh, that is right. We already got our PRF set up, right? Yep, I'm shooting a one, two, two, two. Okay, cool. Moving on then. The pod will emit in three different ways. We can only shoot the laser, only the IR pointer, or both of them at the same time. Press OSB7 for me and cycle through the different options. As you do this, you'll see the indications for the laser status change in the TGP page and in the HUD. Return to laser only mode and let me know when you're ready to press on. Ready to move on. Some of the ways we can get into trouble with the pod are having the wrong PRF set and shooting the pointer only. Having a PRF that differs from the one set on the weapon used will obviously cause an issue. If we have a problem with different codes between the pod and the weapon, or we're in IR pointer mode, we may get a TGP auto laser fail or laser code mismatch message. You should always do a solid cross-check between the weapons profile and TGP settings, or between yourself and whomever you're working with, if you're buddy lazing or being buddy lazed, before you pickle. Roger that. As gangsta as the pot is, it does have its limitations. Smoke, clouds, dust, and sand will all affect the pot. Even on a clear day, the pause laser has a maximum useful range of somewhere around 8 miles. Despite having a limited range, the laser is damn powerful. Make sure you're not shooting it at other airplanes, grunts, or anything else you don't want to risk permanent eye damage to. One more consideration. We are not the only ones with night vision. If you're out there blasting the IR pointer, just remember, it also draws a line straight back to your aircraft that anyone else with NODs can see. That's worth remembering. We're now going to learn the laser spot search process. Sounds good. Let's get after it. With LSS, we're going to use the pod to search for a laser spot in the designated PRF. The pod will automatically begin a search pet looking for that laser energy. Once it detects it, the pod will go into attack mode and slow itself to the laser spot and hold there until we exit the LSS mode. We'll use LSS to get the pod onto a target or an area when we're working with JTAX or other airborne assets like F-15 Echoes or MQ-1 Preds or whatever. Ah, this must be why we've got some boots out here with us today. There's no fooling you. Yeah, Vandal is out here with a PEC-1 just so you can work on LSS. 
So make sure you're paying attention so as to not waste their time. Will do. The first thing you need to know about the laser spot search is that the pod is looking for that laser energy in an area out in front of the jet. It is not looking all over the place for the spot, so you need to have a basic idea where the laser is so you can get the jet and thus the pod pointed in that general direction. Zooming out and putting the pod into wide field of view will also help. Additionally, your pod will need to be looking for the same PRF as the one that Nano is shooting. I believe he is going to be shooting 1688, so go back into your TGP's control page and make sure you see 1688 set for the LSS, please. If it is not, type it into the UFC and pop it into that field. Laser spot search set for 168. I'll make sure Vandal is using that PRF when we check in with him. The 1688 should be good to go. Moving on, providing we're in a good spot to see the spot downrange, and we're looking for the correct PRF, it is a damn simple process, from our side at least. We'll make the call saying we're ready for the lace, and Vandal will call he is lazing. And we press one button, and the pod does the rest. Nice and easy. Just like I like them. Anyways, let's slide over to Stair 6 and we'll see if we can't get a hold of the JDAC to get this party started. Roger, pushing to Stair 6.
set up in a wheel here, and I'll give Vandal a call. Come up 145.250. One's up on 145.250. Vandal 69, Tusk 22, how copy? Tusk 22, Vandal has you Lima Charlie, how me? I have you same, we are en route to IP Ford at this time. Give us five mics and we should be ready if you guys are all set up. We're all set up down here when ready. Tusk 22, copies, thanks guys. Once we've talked through the process, we'll tell Vandal we're IP inbound and headed his way. And we're getting ready for his spot. He'll be lazing a target at Steer 7 for us. Easy enough? Yep, sounds straightforward enough. Good. After Vandal indicates that he's lazing, we'll enter the LSS mode. We can do this a few different ways. One method is to smash OSB6 on the TGP page. Or we can do so by pressing China hat after short on the throttle. Interestingly, we have a sweet upgrade right now and some older jets still mixed in. So if you find yourself in an older suite, some of the hotas has changed. To enter LSS mode in the older ones, you'll want to hit TMS right long instead of the China hat. I'll try to keep that in mind. Please do. Once you're in LSS mode, you'll see the field of view box and stuff disappear. Instead, you'll see a crosshair that fills the entire screen and LSRCH at the bottom of the display. You'll also see the SAQ moving all around, showing you where the pod is looking. It will look for that laser energy until it finds it or until you turn off LSS. We'll assume that it picks up the spot now. Once it detects the spot, that LSRCH will change to detect for only one second. After that, detect will turn into L-Track. The pod will flew to look at the spot, and in the middle of the crosshairs, a box will appear over to the laser spot. Once the pod is laid to the laser spot, it would behoove you to go into either area or point track and maybe even drop a mark point on that spot.
Roger. So, ensure I'm out of LSS and still looking at the target or area that was being lased before I called them to stop lasing. Exactly. More of that, though. Let's say you get the track and fly into a cloud, a tree, or a building blocks your line of sight, or anything else might happen to make you lose sight on it. You're going to have to restart the process all over again. Depending on the circumstances, you may even have to reposition for a better spot to the laser to target line. Doing so can take several minutes, and as you will know, time is critical in CAF, and even more so in a tick. More or less, don't fuck around once you've captured the laser spot and generate your own track. Understood. Read the process back to me from when we call IP inbound and request the laser spot. Once Vandal indicates that he is lasing, I'll activate LSS mode. I can verify this by seeing the crosshair fill the screen, L search down at the bottom of the page, and the SAQ moving around. Once the pod has picked up the spot, it will indicate so by displaying detect. After that, it goes into a track saying L track in the bottom, and the pod slaves to the laser spot. Once that happens, I need to immediately develop my own track or even lay down a marking point. That's exact. Good job. Once you've set up at IP4 to AKA waypoint 6 and are ready, turn towards steer 7. Once you're driving in from the IP, give Vandal a call and tell him you're ready to give it a shot. He'll laze for about 2 minutes. If you don't have it by then, you'll need to reset and try again. Roger, stand by one. Tusk 2 1 is established at IP4 at standing by spot. Copy Tusk, laser target line is 360. Run in heading 320 to 040. Stare TRP 1. Okay, Vandal is south of the target reference point, or TRP. So he is shooting the laser from south to the north. He wants you on a heading between 320 and 040 from the IP. And if he has the pod looking at TRP1 or STAIR7, you should pick up his spot. Remember to transition to a targeting point track once you see l track on the DGP page. Tusk 2-1, spot, these laser. Tusk 2-1, what do you see in your pod? Tusk is contact on a single IFV west of a building. The IFV is oriented east-west. 
Roger, Dusk. The ISV is your target. Dusk 2-1, captured. Nicely done. Let's get out of here in RTB. That final mill, we're checking out, please. Sounds good. We handle Tusk 2-1. Thanks for the support today, fellas. We're RTB. Vandal copies. No problem. Have a safe flight back. See you next time. Let the flow south and RTB. Roger. Blackjack, Tusk 2 is leaving Dogbone and RTB. Tusk 2, exit at 63 Bravo, contact Nellis approach 291.725. Exit via 63 Bravo, approach 291.725, Tusk 2, see ya. Roger, Tusk 2, we're going to be heading back to Bravo, Tusk 2, we're going to be heading back One four five five. Wind calm. Visibility greater than ten miles. Broken sixteen thousand. Dallas approach. Tusk two inbound for recovery with Quebec. Tusk two. Nellis approach. Radar contact. Cleared for the strike recovery. Runway two one left. Report gas peak. Tusk two. We'll go. Let's go ahead and fence out. Save up the laser and make sure master arm and the gun pack are safe. Ensure our countermeasures are in standby mode. And lastly, switch on your exterior lights. Lead is fenced out. I know we covered quite a bit today, but you did pretty well. Thanks. Sure, there are a 
a few points worth going over again though. If the situation permits, try and set yourself and your pot up for the best view of the area of interest. Run the target down the side of the jet with the pot on it and offset from that area a little bit to widen out your field of view. Gaining altitude is another way to try and add in some distance and broaden your field of view as well. When you're in either of the IR modes, don't forget to adjust your gain and levels on the pod to get the best picture and the best track on moving targets in point track mode. Also, don't forget to use the TAF to alert you if you fall below a set altitude. Roger that. The biggest thing to take away from this is this. Don't get sucked into the pod. The TGP is just another tool in our toolbox that can massively improve the thing. It can also dramatically reduce it when misused or overused. The pod has a very narrow field of view at usable ranges, and it is all too easy to lose a handle on the ground situation looking through that proverbial soda straw. Keeping with the same idea, don't forget to look out the damn window. Keeping a good scan while using the pod is going to be the very best way to keep yourself alive and lethal. As great as the pod is, the Mark 1s are still your biggest asset. Point taken. Thanks for working on this with me today. Sure thing. Thanks for being a good student. Approach Task 2, passing gas speed. Task 2, Nellis Approach. Contact Nellis Tower at 327.7. 327.7, Task 2. Nellis Tower. 
Dallas Tower, Tusk 2 with you, just passing Gas Peak on the strike recovery. Tusk 2, Nellis Tower, cleared for visual, runway 21 left, report Apex. Tusk 2 is clear, visual 21 left, we'll call you at Apex. Tusk 2-2, winds calm. Clear to land runway 2-1 left. Check gear. Tusk 2-2, gear down. Clear to land 2-1 left. Tusk 2-1, check gear. Tusk 2-1, three green, clear to land. 2-1 left.
Altitude, altitude. Task 2-1, clear when able. Contact ground 275.8. Task 2-1, switching to ground. Tusk 2-1, clear at Bravo. Tusk 2-1, welcome back. Taxi Golf, Charlie for Thunder. Golf and Charlie. 